Is grace merely a divine hug? One of the number one techniques the enemy uses in any culture is to redefine terminology. Words are carrying devices for truth, and if words lose their meaning, then truth is lost. Grace is one of those words that has come under attack in our generation. And as a result, much of the church has lost the true meaning of grace, and this is precisely the situation Jude is addressing in the early church. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. What is lasciviousness? Probably the best way of describing it would be a license to sin. In other words, they turn the grace of God into a license or a freedom to sin because, oh, well, God is gracious, he'll overlook that. You see, he knows I'm in the mud. And so he will just hug me even though I continue to sin. And so when you turn the grace of God into a license or now a freedom to commit sin, what are you doing? Well, that's the work of ungodliness. That is something that denies the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, that's precisely what has happened to grace in our generation. Our definition of grace needs to come from the Bible. And what we've done is we've created this ambiance about this word, which is not false, it's just not fully true. And that is that it's the hug of God upon those of us that are wretched sinners. That God overlooks our sin and hugs us. He knows that we're a pile of mess, and yet He comes out of heaven and He hugs us. He says, I'll hold you near and love you through your sin. That concept of the license or the hug in the mud isn't even in the Bible. God is merciful, yes. He is long-suffering, He is kind, and He so loves the world that He gave His only begotten Son, yes. But to save us, not to merely cover. He's not merely shedding the blood of lambs and goats as in the Old Testament. He's rescuing us from our bondage. He's renting our chains. He's breaking down the prison chambers and he's driving us out of Egypt. We are no longer under the slave master. We have been set free to enter into a new land, a new kingdom ruled by King Jesus. Very different. What has happened to Christianity? Well, let's get it back right here. Let's start by exploring grace in the Bible. When you are introduced to biblical grace, it is one of the most exciting things you will ever see in your life. You'll understand, I'm saved by that. That is what's sufficient for me. No wonder I've been living a defeated life. I didn't know what I had. You have something that the Bible refers to as grace. And if you think grace is merely a hug, well then you're not gonna call on it when you need strength. Grace is strength. It is enabling power. It is that which doesn't just hug us in the mud, but lifts us out of the mud. It is not just that which lifts us out of the mud, but that which cleanses, washes us, drives away the sin from us, sets our feet upon something solid, and then sticks the grace within us to animate this body to live the supernatural life, the life that reveals Jesus Christ, that we would bear His image, that we would be conformed into his likeness. How in the world do you expect to do that in your strength? How in the world does Christianity work? It works by something known as grace. No man can ever do it. But God can. And that's the gospel. You can't. He can. You turn away from your pockets, your ability, and you say, but you can do it. Take this vessel. Fill this vessel. Enable this vessel. You do it, God. A modern Christian author in a popular book on grace wrote the following. He said, this is the gospel of grace. A God who out of love for us sent the only son he ever had wrapped in our skin. He learned how to walk, stumbled and fell, cried for his milk, sweated blood in the night, was lashed with a whip and showered with spit, was fixed to a cross and died whispering forgiveness on us all. Is this true? Yes. But is it fully true? No. You see, this is what we could call a part truth. One of the most dangerous things about how the enemy works is he doesn't work with all-out lies, he works with part truths. 
This is a part truth because it leaves the gospel of grace unfinished. Grace is more than just God whispering forgiveness. You see, they left out the power, the might, the gusto of grace. So let's finish the story. And then the Son of God rose again, was exalted above every name and every authority, and at Pentecost gave himself in power to his disciples that they might be made holy and become true pictures of the triumph of grace to the glory of God. And once again, the Son is wrapped in human skin. This is the complete gospel of grace. There's more. Let's not shortchange the Word of God, the work of the cross, our resurrected, exalted Christ, to try and make ourselves comfortable with the idea of grace. I want you to look at the Word of God and simply say, I believe. This is how it has always functioned. It does not function in its own strength. It does not function in its own ability. It does not function in its own talents. It must receive something. And without that something, it is impotent. You see, something is wrong with us. We are not as we ought to be. We are not as God is. But we try because we love Jesus. We appreciate what he did, but we don't understand grace. And so we, in our own efforts, attempt to do the work that only grace can do, and we attempt to imitate a God that we cannot imitate. So we're doing our best, but we can't do it. You know what you need? You need grace.